Welcome, everybody. We're going to be now teaching about this fantastic month that we are entering, the month of Kislev. Does anyone know which tribe belongs to the month of Kislev? It is Benjamin. He is the winner. So we're going to look at both the month of Kislev as well as a little bit about the tribe of Benjamin and why this month belongs to him. We're going to begin with Genesis 1.14, as we always do when we study uh, why we keep the new moon festival. It says, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And then he says, let these lights be for signs, seasons, days, and years. And so we find he's talking here about the biblical calendar, about the Moedim, about the feast days. And we know the new moon is the official start of every month. And if you don't have the new moon, you don't know when to keep any of the other festivals during that month, which is why uh, the Romans several thousand years ago did not want the Jewish people to cite the calendar because that effectively would destroy their keeping all of the commandments of God as far as the Moedim. And so we also know in Genesis, as long as we are there, it begins with the tree of life. Let's look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 9. It says, Out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And then it says, And the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You know, it's interesting. This is just a side note. The big problem is when there is no division between good and evil. Sometimes people say, well, we don't want to be divisive. Well, we have to have the right attitude, but God is divisive. Every day he was dividing. He was dividing light from darkness, water from land. It's all about division. What caused death is where there was no division. Good and evil were on the same tree. Okay, so we have to understand this concerning the tree of life. Not only does the Bible begin with this tree of life, it also ends with the tree of life. Look at this in Revelation 22, verse 1 and 2. God showed John a river of water of life, as clear as crystal. And it proceeded out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. This is in Jerusalem. And in the middle of the street. And it says on one side of the river and on that was the what? There it is. The tree of life again. And it says they, the tree of life bore 12 different kinds of fruit yielding its fruit every month. When it says it yielded its fruit every month, that was not January 1st, February 1st, March 1st. Forget that calendar is going to be done away with. We're going to go back to the biblical calendar on Kislev 1, okay? On Tibet 1, on Sabbat 1. So what about, we see this, that this is what it begins with and ends with. But what about when Jesus returns? What about the millennial reign when Jesus is here? Are we still going to be keeping that old stuff? Well, let's look. At Ezekiel chapter 46 and verse 1, it says, Thus says the Lord God, the gate of the inner court that looks toward the east will be shut the six working days, but on the Sabbath day it will be opened, and in the day of the new moon it will be opened. Wow, even during the millennial reign when Yeshua was here for a thousand years, we're still going to be keeping the new moon. Well, how about when the millennial reign is over? We're now in the eighth day. We're inhabiting eternity, new heavens, new earth, new sun, new moon. Look what it says in Isaiah 66, verse 22 and 23. God says, even as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord. So your seed and your name will remain. He's referring to Israel here, guys. It shall happen that from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, all flesh will come to worship before me, says the Lord. Wow, can you imagine that? Every Shabbat, everyone has to come and worship before the Lord. And then on the new moon, which could be any day during the week, 
everyone has to come together again. And this is for all eternity. If this is something we're going to be doing for all eternity, why not practice now? It won't be a surprise. Okay, and then look at what he says in Psalms 104, verse 19 through 21. It says, God specifically, we just read in Genesis 114, made the moon for signs. Well, look here. He says in Psalm 104, 19 through 21, God made the moon to mark the seasons. Okay, well, that's not talking about winter, spring, summer, fall. It goes again back to because the new moon sets the calendar for the festivals. And it says the sun knows when it's supposed to go down. And then it says, God, you're the one who makes darkness. And it is night wherein all the beasts of the forest are creeping around. And then it says the young lions roar after their prey and they seek their food from God. I know a little bit about the young lions roaring after their prey. <laughs> I've been there. I was almost there at lunch. All right. And then let's look at Psalm 81, verse 3 and 4. What does it say? It says, blow the shofar at the new moon and at the full moon for our feast days. For it is a statute for Israel. It is an ordinance of the God of Jacob. And so that is why the shofar is blown. I have a little ram's horn. This is a special ram's horn. This is from the sheep that are called Jacob's sheep, the spotted ones that have, you know, gone away for the last 4,000 years, but are now back. Uh, it's called the Jacob sheep shofar, uh, made in Israel, not China. <laughs> this is a Jacob sheep. So we're going to blow the shofar. I'm not the best shofar blower in the world, but we're going to try. I should have stuck with the big shofar. <laughs> All right. One of the amazing things, too, about this whole idea of the moon and the festivals, it really, the whole thing is about God's covenant with King David, like he said in Isaiah 66. This is a statute forever. Israel will always remain before him, specifically the tribe of Judah, the Jewish people, King David. Listen to Psalm 89 and verse 20. God says, I have found David, my servant, with my holy oil, I've anointed him with whom my hand will be established. My arm also will strengthen him. And then it goes on to say in verse 23 and verse 24 of Psalm 89, Listen to what God says concerning David's enemies, or I should say the Jewish people's enemies. God says, I'm going to beat them to pieces. That's what he says. I will beat to pieces David's adversaries before him. I'm going to smite those who hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy will be with David, and through my name shall his horn be exalted. And then it goes on to say in verse 28 and verse 29, God says, forever, how long is forever? Forever will I keep for him my mercy. Here it is. My covenant will stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever and his throne as the days of heaven. And then in verse 33 through 37, look at what God says concerning the Jewish people. King David in particular. He says, nevertheless, my loving kindness, I will not utterly take from him, nor allow my faithfulness to fail. My covenant, God says, I will not break. I will not alter the word that's gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever. And his throne will be as the sun before me. It will be established forever like the moon even the faithful witness in the sky the moon is god's faithful witness in the sky that his covenant will never cease from david so whenever you do look out at the moon and you see it be a new moon a full moon whenever you see the moon you need to be reminded wow god keeps covenant with the jewish people 
Matter of fact, look at Jeremiah. This is chapter 33, verse 25 and 26. Thus says the Lord, if my covenant isn't with day and night, and if I'm not the one who appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth, then I will cast away the descendants of Jacob and David, my servant. Do you think there's anyone else who appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth? I don't think so. And then in Exodus 12, 2, God is speaking to Moses and he says, This month shall be your beginning of months. It will be the first month of the year to you. And so here's where he gives the authority of the religious calendar. The civil calendar basically was for all of mankind. God is now introducing a religious calendar, which does not do away with the civil calendar. He's just saying, okay, Israel, you are the ones that get to help me determine when these festivals are done. Now, when it comes to sanctification, because we're supposed to sanctify the new moon, do we make ourselves holy or does God make us holy? God makes us holy, but then we're to maintain that. So it's like a teamwork here. Listen to Leviticus 20, verse 7 and 8. God says, do consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. I want you to keep my statutes and perform them, for I am the Lord who sanctifies you. So God sanctifies us. He sets us apart. How does he set us apart? By telling us to do the things that he's asked us to do. Okay, are you supposed to obey the neighbor's dad or your dad? Are you supposed to obey the neighbor's mom or your mom? Okay, well, if we're going to be holy to God, we have to do the things that he asks, not what the other people ask. Pretty simple. Okay, so look at Leviticus 20, verse 26. God says, you are to be holy to me. For I, the Lord, am holy. I'm the one who have separated you from all the nations that you should be mine. Okay, so... In one sense, we don't make ourselves holy. God makes us holy, but then we keep and maintain that holiness by doing what he says, not what we want to do. Okay, I, I like to give the example. Uh, let's say you get hired at McDonald's and, and you're going to be the hamburger flipperer, okay? And you get there, they hire you to be the hamburger flipper, and you go, I just love McDonald's, but you know what? I really like gardening, so I want to go out and work at the plants around the building. How long are you going to work there? Okay, they didn't hire you to do the plants, even though that's what you love. Well, guess what? When it comes to what God asks us to do, we don't look at what can we do for God as much as what did God ask us to do, and that's what we're supposed to be doing. We do see we need to maintain our holiness. So look at Leviticus 18.30. God says, Therefore you shall keep my charge, that you do not any of these abominable customs, which were done before you, so you do not defile yourselves. I am the Lord your God. Okay, so we don't want to defile ourselves by doing what other nations said. That was the problem uh, in the Ezekiel part we've been teaching about. They wanted to be like all the nations. And God says, I don't want you to be like all the nations. I want to separate you. So we need to make sure that we are set apart and we are different. So with that said, let's stand and we're going to say the prayers uh, for the new moon. And then I'll teach you a little bit about the tribe of Benjamin. Okay, it's up there. All right, let's read this together. May it be thy will, Lord, our God and God of our fathers, that you begin for us this month for good and for blessing. May you give to us long life, a life of peace, a life of goodness, a life of blessing, a life of substance, a life of physical health, a life in which there is fear of heaven and fear of sin, a life in which there is no shame or humiliation, a life of wealth and honor, a life in which we love Torah and fear God, a life in which the Lord fulfills the requests of our hearts for good. Amen. Say la together. Blessed are you, O Lord our God of the universe who created the skies by your word, all the heavens host with the breath of your mouth. You gave them appointed times and roles, and they never miss their cues. Doing their creator's bidding with gladness and joy, you are the true creator who acts faithfully and has told the moon to renew itself. It is a beautiful crown for the people of Israel, 
who are carried by God from birth and who will likewise be renewed in the future in order to proclaim the beauty of their creator for his glorious majesty. Blessed are you, O Lord, who renews the moons. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by your commandments and commanded us to be a light to the nations and has given us Yeshua, our Messiah, the light of the world. Amen. You can be seated. And now I'm going to give you a, a quick teaching about the significance of this month. But wait, there's more. Exactly. <clears throat> All right. Here we are in the month of Kislev. When Hanukkah is celebrated, there's also the very month the rainbow first appeared from Noah's flood. And I have there going right to left in Hebrew, the word Kislev. You have the Kof Samak Lamed Vav. That is Kislev, which is going to be kind of significant. Um, one of the interesting things, uh, let me see. Yes, I want to make sure I say it at the right time. Okay, so here we go. Get a load of this. In Genesis chapter 7, verse 11 and 12, it talks about how it was in the 600th year of Noah's life. In the second month, on the 17th day of the month, the fountains of the great deep came bursting through. The windows of heaven were open, and rain came down on the, on the earth for how many days? 40 days and 40 nights. All right, well, we just read in Genesis 7, 11, and 12 that the rains began on the 17th day of the second month. Now, this is long before Moses, so this is on the civil calendar, and the second month is Heshvan. Okay, so it was on the 17th day of Heshvan the rains fell, and it rained for how many days and nights? 40 days and 40 nights. Well, you, if you look at any Jewish calendar, uh, especially one that we have here at El Shaddai, and you go to the 17th of Eshvan, and you count 40 days, that takes you right to the middle of Hanukkah, Kislev 28. So the rain stopped on Kislev 28 in the middle of Hanukkah, and that is when this most gorgeous rainbow appears. All right, it's the first time a rainbow ever could possibly be seen. Well, guess what? When you understand the biblical calendar, what do we know? Kislev is when the winter solstice is. It is the darkest day when you look at the, when it gets dark, right on the winter solstice, all of a sudden light begins to enter. Well, guess what? The Messiah was conceived right at the middle of Hanukkah. And that way he was born nine months later at the Feast of Tabernacles. So the amazing thing is that the darkest time on earth is when light came in to the world. Now, the other thing that's interesting is that the root word of Kislev, the Kof Samak Lamed, also means hope. And this word here you'll find in Psalms means hope. So what's interesting is hope also came when Messiah entered into this world. Now, um, one of the other things they say, because that's just a scientific natural phenomenon, after, if you believe Adam was born, uh, you know, on Tishri 1, which is what we believe, let's say the end of September, October, somewhere in there, okay, well, guess what? A few months later, it started getting darker earlier. That's just natural science. And they say that Adam, here he sinned, and all of a sudden it's getting darker and darker, and the light is getting worse and worse, and he's kind of panicking, what have I done? Uh, but then fortunately it started getting brighter and uh, brighter. Now, here's the other thing. What do we know about Hanukkah? Hanukkah is when the Maccabees were fighting and you have light versus darkness, okay? Well, uh, one of the interesting things about this, there were two wars that were being fought by the Maccabees. There was a physical war, and what are they doing? They are opposing the Syrian Greeks who oppose God and his Torah, the physical war. But there was also 
a spiritual war that takes place. It was a war against assimilation by the Hellenistic Jews. And what do we find in modern Christianity? There are many who, there's a spiritual war going on between true believers and nominal believers. All right. Well, this is the month that the battle really takes place. We are now entering a month when there is a big, not only physical battle, but a spiritual going light, spiritual fight going on between light and darkness, between Lot and Abraham, between the believers who have assimilated into the world versus the believers like Abraham that are up trying to intercede for the world. That is a battle that takes place this month. Okay. Now, something else I want to bring out. What Bible character has the same root word as Hanukkah? Enoch. Hanukkah. Okay, so Enoch and Hanukkah are the same. And guess what Enoch's name means in Hebrew? It means to educate, to train. There's an education that has to go on. We've got to teach the next generation, which is why what did Rome do? They said, no, I don't want you teaching the next generation, so you're not citing the new moon, you're not following Torah, you're not keeping the Sabbath. Do we not find that going on in our world today where everyone is trying to take away those things for their children? As a matter of fact, just recently there's a book that's come out that is opposed to the big left push of trying to transgenderize kindergartners and first graders, okay? Okay. So uh, it's kind of fascinating the days that we're living in when it's one thing about burning books, but, you know, when they want to take away books. But what happens when the book publishing companies on the Internet don't allow books? Who knows how long you'll be able to get these books, you know? So uh, the other thing, when you think about it, with computers the way they are, everyone going to Kindle or electronic books or things like that, how long will a book last physically? Maybe 50 years. Who knows? It depends on how it's treated. But I can see how the enemy would love to take away all physical books, just have electronic books, and then they control what books you can read. And if all of a sudden the important books tend to, oh, there was a malfunction. We lost them on the Internet. Now you don't even have the electronic books available. But this is the month about educating the next generation. Look at this. This is uh, phenomenal. This is also, I mentioned this, I highlight this next verse in my book, Decoding the Prophet Jeremiah. Look at Jeremiah 36, verse 22 through 24. Here, this is the story of the king, Jehoiakim. He's sitting in his winter house in the ninth month. Guess what the ninth month is on the biblical calendar? Kislev. Okay. And as a matter of fact, I believe this was during Hanukkah. Even though Hanukkah hadn't occurred yet, this is centuries before, but the patterns always repeat. Here he is in the winter house in the ninth month. There was a fire in the fireplace burning before him. And it came to pass when Yehudi had read three or four leaves. This is from the scroll. Jeremiah told Baruch to write this warning to the king that he might repent. Baruch gives it to Yehudi. Yehudi reads it before the king. Three or four leaves. And it says, what did the king do? He cut it with a knife and he threw it into the fire in the fireplace until the roll was consumed in the fire. And they were not even afraid of the warning that God had given. They didn't rend their garments. Neither did the king or any of his servants that heard all these words. This isn't all my notes, but this is just uh, amazing to me. You have to realize, Yehoiakim, who hears the word of the Lord about destruction is coming, he does not fear God, he cuts it up and throws it in the fire. Yehoiakim was 13 years old when his dad, King Josiah, heard the word of the Lord from the town scroll, uh, Torah scroll, and he rent his garment from top to bottom, Josiah repenting says, wow, with this heavy warning, we need to repent. Yehoiakim was a bar mitzvah boy, and he saw that happen. And he, at this time, he hears it personally to him, and he does not rend his garments. Instead, he cuts it up, and he throws it into the fire. So here, it says, is it three or four leaves that are thrown in the fire, right? Well, guess what? At this very same time, 
in Babylon, here in Jerusalem, he's cutting up three or four leaves of the word of the Lord into the fire. It was at that time the word of the Lord appeared in the fire with the three Hebrew children, saving them. Isn't that fascinating, this connection? Okay. Uh, who are some famous people we know from the tribe of Benjamin? Uh, Rabbi Shaul, Apostle Paul. Who else? How about Mordecai and Esther? All right. Well, get a load of this. Right after Mordecai and Esther, historically, now comes Ezra and Nehemiah. They're returning back. They're trying to rebuild the temple. And here it says in Nehemiah 1, 1 through 7, the history of Nehemiah. It says it came about in the month of Kislev. All right. So here he was in Sushan. Remember Sushan? That's where Mordecai and Esther were. This is where he was. So he is there. And it says certain men from Judah in an answer to my request for news of the Jews who had been prisoners that had gotten away to Jerusalem. They said to me, guess what? There's just a small band of Jews now living in Jerusalem, and they're in great trouble and shame. The walls of Jerusalem have been broken down. The doors are burned with fire. And then it says, after hearing these words, for some days he gave himself up to weeping and sorrow. He was sitting on the earth. He took no food, and he made his prayer to the God of heaven. And he said, O Lord, the God of heaven, the great God, greatly to be feared, keeping faith and mercy with those who have loved for him and are true to his Torah, he says, God, let your ear now take note and let your eyes be open so that you may give ear to the prayer of your servant, which I make before you at this time, day and night for the children of Israel, your servants, while I put before you the sins of the children of evil. He's, he's still, he says, look, I'm making this request, but I want you to know, yes, I know we've sinned. He says, we've done great wrong against you. We've not kept your orders, your rules, your decisions, which you gave to your servant Moses. What's amazing is this is around a thousand years. Well, here we are, 3,000 years, and it's still applicable. We're not doing the laws that he's given to his servant Moses. And then we find in Ezra, chapter 10, verse 9 through 13, then all the men of Judah and Benjamin, here he is, came together to Jerusalem before the three days were passed, and it was the ninth month, on the 20th day of the month, five days here before Hanukkah. All the people were seated in the wide square in front of the house of God. It had been built. And they were shaking with fear because of this business of marrying these foreign wives and because of the great rain. This is the time of the great rain in Israel during Hanukkah. And Ezra the priest got to his feet and said, you've done wrong in taking these strange women for your wives, so increasing the sins of Israel. Uh, and then he says this, he says, the number of the people that have done this is great. It's a time of much rain. It's not possible for us to go on waiting outside in the rain and this isn't a thing that we can be done in one day or even two, for our sin in this business is great. So I tell you what, this is a month of repentance. Kislev is a month of physical warfare. It's a month of spiritual warfare. And it's a month that we need to make our prayer to God for the sins of our nation. Uh, lastly, I want to tell you, Kislev is also the month for prophetic dreams. Kislev is the month of dreams. Did you know that there are nine dreams recorded in the three Torah portions during this month? Vayetzi, Vayeshev, and Maketz. The next, this whole month, every week, the Torah portion is about dreams. It so happens, get a load of this, the ninth gemstone on the breastplate of the high priest belonged to Benjamin, and the ninth month is Hanukkah, and the ruby or, or the gemstone was an amethyst. And the Hebrew word for amethyst is the same root word for dreams. Everything is tied together here. So the month belongs to Benjamin. How many kids did Benjamin have? Do you remember? Here's what's fascinating. Remember they kept calling him a lad when they brought him into Egypt. Well, when he came into Egypt, he had 10 kids. He had 10 kids, and guess what? He was only about 30 years old. Well, I tell you what, it is possible. Because when my mom and dad were each 30 years old, they had nine kids. <laughs> they got married around 17, and no twins. 
just one right after another. I've got five older sisters, three older brothers, and a younger brother. I'm the eighth of nine kids. And my parents got married at 17, and when they were 30, they already had all nine of us. We were a good Catholic family. <laughs> and so in Genesis 47, 7 through 9, <clears throat> so Joseph made his father Jacob come before Pharaoh, and Jacob gave him his blessing, and Pharaoh said to Jacob, How old are you? And Jacob said, The years of my wanderings have been 130. Okay? So Jacob was 130 years old when he appeared before Pharaoh. Now, if you want to take some notes down, I'm going to give you some math, but I'm just going to kind of help you get, put this together. Jacob is 130. His son Joseph is 39. Jacob was 91 when Joseph was born. Okay? So Joseph, when his family is coming, is 39 years old. Benjamin, as we know, was the only one who was born in the promised land. All the other ones were born with, over in Laban's area, okay? Benjamin was the only one born in Israel. When Jacob left Laban and entered the promised land, Joseph was six years old. So when, when Laban gets, or when uh, Jacob leaves with Rachel and Leah and all the kids, Joseph is six years old. We know Joseph was sold at 17 years old. And he had already developed a relationship with his little brother, Benjamin. So Benjamin had to be born sometime during that 11-year time period between Joseph entering the promised land at 6 and being sold at 17. Now, we do know some time had passed upon entering the promised land before Benjamin was born because they spent time in Sukkot and in Shechem first where Simeon and Levi killed all the Shechemites. And then after that, then they head to Bethel and then... On the road to Bethlehem is when Benjamin is born uh, and uh, Rebekah dies. So if Jacob was 100 when Benjamin was born, remember Joseph was born at 91. If Jacob is 100 when Benjamin was born, Joseph would have been 9 and would have known Benjamin until Benjamin was at least 8 years old. So if that was so, Benjamin would have been around 30 when he entered Egypt and uh, the tribe of Benjamin was in where the temple was. The temple itself was in Benjamin's territory. Uh, and they say, uh, remember, they didn't want to take Benjamin from Jacob because it, his heart would just die. Well, they say Benjamin is the one who took care of Jacob those last years of his life. So that tells you a little bit about this month, what's coming, what we need to be prepared for. Uh, with that said, we'll stand and we'll say the priestly blessing. To, uh, so let's pray. God told Moses to tell Aaron, this is the blessing I want you to say. And if you say it, not only will I bless them, I'm going to put my name upon them. And this is what he told him to say. Ivarekka Adonai veishmarekka. Ya'er Adonai panav ileka vichuneka. Yisa Adonai panav ileka v'yasem laka shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lit up his countenance upon you and give you peace. His shalom in that most wonderful name. Amen. See you next month.